Hi, this is Jane Lipkowski, and I'm the president of Regenerative Patch Technologies. I'm going to be talking to you today about our development of a bioengineered implant for the treatment of the dry form of age-related macular degeneration. So let me tell you a little bit about Regenerative Patch first. Uh, we're a clinical stage company formed to advance technology that was developed at four different California institutions. The lead product, the target indication for that lead product is for the treatment of advanced dry AMD, which is an, a large unmet medical need worldwide. We have now um, are in the final stages of collecting data in a phase one, two A clinical trial. And we have three year follow up on all patients that were enrolled and treated in the trial. We're preparing to initiate a phase 2B clinical trial in which we have clearance from the FDA on both the trial design and on the endpoints that will be used for that clinical trial. We also have an extensive intellectual property uh, portfolio with over 29 issued and 12 pending applications worldwide. And it covers the product and the way we deliver the implant to the subretinal space. So what's the clinical problem that we're trying to address? It's the advanced form of dry AMD. Over 10 million patients in the US have dry AMD and over 1.7 million have the advanced form of dry AMD. It leads to blindness, inability to read, drive, recognize faces, and extensive dependence on caregivers. The unfortunate thing about this disease is that there are no approved therapy for advanced dry AMD. Conventional drugs have failed in the clinic and that current drugs that are in the advanced forms uh, of development right now are really intended to slow the progression of disease and not to improve vision in those patients who already have the disease. So what is this implant that we're developing and what is it designed to do? Well, it's essentially to replace the function of retinal pigmented epithelial cells and the Brooks membrane, which degenerate in patients with advanced dry AMD. This, these particular structures, these cells and the Brooks membrane serve as support for both the survival and function of the rest of the retina, the photoreceptors in the retina. And we're now developing, uh, the implant that we're developing has retinal pigmented epithelial cells on a very defined scaffold so that we can actually implant it and use it as a regenerative medicine therapy, as a tissue replacement therapy. So this is just a picture of the two components of the implant along with the implant itself. You can see on the left-hand side here, these are the retinal pigmented epithelial cells, the key biological component of the implant. The second uh, component is the scaffold, the scaffold designed to allow for the diffusible properties that very similarly resemble that of the Brooks membrane. And then finally, the implant itself, it's about three and a half by six and a half millimeters in surface area, six microns thick. And it allows for, it covers essentially uh, the entire macula. It has a handle for insertion and also a landmark that orients the implant for insertion by the um, surgeons who are doing the implantation. So a little bit more about the implant itself. There are the RPE cells, the biological component of the implant. They're derived from pluripotent stem cells. And when placed on the perylene membrane, they can recapitulate their normal structure in the retina, having basal and apical surfaces that each have distinct functions in the retina. The ultra-thin perylene membrane, again, is designed to replace the function of the Brooks membrane, and it's fabricated by, um, from a, a USP class six biocompatible monomer that's been used in the clinic for over 30 years. 
Uh, the key IP here is that we can machine this Brooks membrane, or we can machine this parallel membrane to a very precise thickness to recreate the diffusion properties of the Brooks membrane. It's another important feature is that it's foldable so that we can curl up essentially the implant to allow it to be uh, transported and into the subretinal space with a very small retinotomy. The, uh, the implant has now been utilized in a phase one, two, a clinical trial. Uh, all patients enrolled had a advanced dry, dry age related macular degeneration with geographic atrophy involving the central fovea. There were 16 patients enrolled, 15 of which were implanted. All implanted patients had a best corrected visual acuity of equal to or worse than 2200, meaning they were all legally blind in the treated eye. It's one size fits all. And that in this particular case, we were looking for safety and tolerability of the implant one year post uh, implantation but also looking for signals of activity. This trial was conducted at six different clinical trial sites in California and in Arizona. So this just gives you a scheme of the clinical trial. In this case, patients were screened at baseline and implanted on day zero. At, at baseline, we also started uh, patients on uh, immunosuppression, protocol, which was 68 days of tacrolimus. Patients after implantation were continued on tacrolimus through day 60. All patients then were followed for their primary endpoint at one year and then are now in a long-term follow-up protocol. Everybody has been followed now for at least three years. So the implantation procedure uses very well-established retinal surgery procedures. There's vitrectomies. There's a hydro dissection of the area of geographic atrophy. And then there's a small retinotomy of about 1.5 millimeters. The implant is then taken up and delivered using a custom tool with forceps that grab the implant and subsequently pull it into a shaft and in the process, curl it up like a taco. To insert it into the subretinal space, the, the, we have a reverse process transported through the retinotomy and then ejected slowly um, into the subretinal space. And then there's some, subsequently a tamponade. So again, all of these implants were administered in an outpatient procedure. So what about some of the results from these clinical trials? Um, we've shown now the procedure is feasible and it's safe in the outpatient setting. Um, we have tweaked the implantation procedure to minimize hemorrhage and fibrinous debris that might be generated during the procedure. We've shown now that the implant is stably positioned over the area of geographic atrophy in every subject that has been implanted. Um, and there's no degeneration over time. And here looking at uh, up to one year post-implantation. There's no evidence that the implant degenerates and it covers the majority of the area of geographic atrophy. The cells that we use on the implant are allogeneic. And uh, one of the important things was to show that the cells can survive even though they're going into uh, an, an allogeneic recipient. One patient in our clinical trial uh, did pass away after two years due to unrelated causes. And we were able to harvest the eyes and look for the presence of the implant and the cells on top of the implant. Here we show, in this case, in this h &E stain, that there's a presence of the implant, again, two years post uh, implantation with pigmented cells on top of that implant. Uh, further studies, histology, we looked at and shown that the RPE cells have functional markers of uh, RPE cells, RPE 65, a sodium potassium ATPase, and in fact are functional in that they have, uh, are producing and it can engulf phagosomes of photoreceptors. We've also shown now that 
uh, through um, looking at composite pictures across the entire implant that we can see pigmented cells that remain across the entire extent of the implant. So um, what about the safety profile? We've shown now that there are no unanticipated serious events that occurred either due to the surgery or the implant. We did have patients in the initial cohorts and other initial patients that were enrolled that we did see some patients with SAEs related to hemorrhage or edema that has now been rectified. Um, and through, again, tweaking of the surgical procedure to better manage hem hemorrhage, uh, we have now seen no further uh, incidences of SAEs related to hemorrhage or edema. I, at um, the tacrolimus immunosuppression protocol is well, um, well tolerated in most subjects, and there is no evidence of rejection of the cells, even with just a short 68-day immunosuppression protocol. An important feature also is that in some cases, there, the implant was, was also covering areas of the retina that were normal, normal, healthy retina. And if you look at those areas, looking at, for instance, OCT, you can see that it remains normal, healthy architecture over those areas of normal retina, retina that are over the implant. So what about signals of activity? Um, at one year, we have made several observations now. We can see in some patients the reappearance of the external limiting membrane over the implant, suggestive of preservation or reformation of some of the normal uh, architecture of the retina. Also 27% or four out of 15 patients showed a greater than five letter improvement in best corrective visual acuity. And the improvements range from six to 13 letters at one year. This was pretty outstanding. We were excited about this data, considering the severity of the disease in these patients. Uh, the best corrected view, the best corrected visual acuity was either stable or improved in 67%, which is a win in these patients. We have also now followed these patients for long term, um, and we're looking at their best corrected visual acuity as of their last. Uh, time of follow-up, which was a mean of 34 months, median of 36 range, uh, months, with a range of 12 to 48 months. And you can see then that those patients that did uh, improve, it's relatively stable, with four out of 15 patients having a seven to 15 letter improvement in best corrected visual acuity in the treated eye. The untreated eye, in no case did any patient have an improvement of best corrective visual acuity, although all patients had evidence of geographic atrophy in the untreated eye. If you looked at patients who were improved or were stable, 60% of the treated eyes remained stable or improved, whereas only 20% in the untreated eye remained stable or improved. Likewise, in terms of getting worse, uh, patients uh, in the treated eye, only 40% of those progressed in lost more than five letters uh, of visual acuity, whereas in the untreated eye, 80% or 12 out of 15 patients lost somewhere from eight to 21 letters of best corrective visual acuity. So we're pretty excited about this preliminary data and have now shown that in fact, we can show the safety and feasibility of administration of the implant the safety of the, immuno, uh, the implant itself, the tolerability of the immunosuppression regimen, and the survival of the implanted allogeneic cells, along with some early signals of activity that obviously need to be repeated in a phase 2B clinical trial. We are now preparing for that phase 2B clinical trial and also expanding the use of this implant for other indications. And lastly, looking at expanding this as a platform to incorporate other cells for additional therapeutic applications. So I'll end here um, with the acknowledgements of the patients and their caregivers who participated in the trial and all of the various team members that participated in developing and clinically testing this implant.
Thank you very much.